All right, good morning, everybody. So welcome to today's uh, Northeastern um, Extension Fruit Consortium Winter Webinar Series. Um, this webinar is brought by uh, Extension um, agents from uh, UMass, University of Vermont, uh, New Hampshire, Maine, Yukon, uh, Rhode Island, and uh, Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, and Cornell. So today, it is our pleasure to welcome Dr. Kerry Cox um, to deliver today's uh, winter webinar. Uh, Dr. Cox manages a program of tree fruit and berry research and extension at Cornell University's New York State Agricultural Experiment Station, the AgriTech. The principal research efforts of Dr. Cox include antimicrobial resistance for both fungicides and antibiotics and applied disease management with a focus on apple, stone fruit, and strawberry. The extension efforts of Dr. Cox focus on the pesticide education, disease forecasting, and, uh, and applied disease management with emphasis on covered production in small fruit. Teaching efforts include both undergraduate and graduate level plant pathology and IPM courses, as well as leadership on student learning committees. Since the establishment of his program, Dr. Cox has been conducting antimicrobial resistance and invasive pathogen surveys in New York and the Northeastern United States. So today he's gonna present, his presentation is entitled Fungicide and Streptomycin Resistance in Apple Pathogens, Status and Management. So Dr. Cox, uh, take it away. All right. Okay. Let's let's do this. Let's settle in for our long, long talk. It's longer than most lectures, and most students are asleep in the first thirty minutes. So we're going to see how it works out. Hope everyone's got their pillows and their phones charged. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. All right. Let's do this. Yeah. A lot of the work I'm going to talk about today, um, some of my own and my two students, Anna Wallace and Katrin Ayer, who have both moved on. Anna's at uh, MSU and Katrin is in a startup company on in Connecticut. And yeah, we're gonna talk about everything, fungicide, streptomycin resistance. I've got a timer set that I can no longer see. Oh, well, okay, let's start that. And yeah, let's, let's do this and see how far we get and how much we wanna cover. There's a lot of things that one can cover and sort of our pantheon of sort of recent research on this type of stuff. Let's do it. Let's hope it's still sharing the main screen since it's a strange it's doing a little bit weird sharing today but anyway let's talk about antimicrobial resistance you can use the general term when you want to talk about both fungicides and antibiotics in general and this is sort of more widely used in the medical system and much like in medicine our tree fruit systems are very similar if you think about it they live well, we hope they live longer than five years and the management periods for a particular disease susceptibility are, you know, like months, six to seven months before it becomes winter again. And so they're kind of like a person, you know, going out and getting bacterial and fungal infections, and they have to be managed very similarly. And one of the other things that's kind of tense is that the fruit pathogens are many like some of the fungal pathogens of people, and they have all these numerous secondary infection cycles. There's spores, they can repeat. Same with bacteria, they're just making more and more numbers. And it's a system that's a lot more like uh, the MedVet system than in cereals. A lot of the work that talks about how resistance is selected and stuff comes from cereal modeling and cereal diseases, but cereal crops are really different from a tree. And in my discussions with departments of um, meat science and vet and medicine, seems to be more akin to what they're finding. And in many instances, other than the fact that um, trees can't move unless we pick them up and move them, the populations are fairly localized. And so whatever you're doing on your farm is what's happening. And with the exception of stuff like fire blight that you might bring in on tissue, you know, your cherry leaf spot, your brown rot, and even if you happen to be in Costa Rica, your black segatoka of banana, it's just going to be what you're doing on your farm. And the same will apply to our apple scab and our fire blight as well. 
And as we move on, sort of this one sort of concept, two phases of antimicrobial resistance development occur. And this, there is some good commonalities between the cereal world and ours in this one. And this is kind of what we might be working with. You can think of this as your population of trees. Let's see if I can change this to the old laser pointer. Boop, there we go. And yep, so two phases, emergence and establishment. It's got a big sensitive blob of population. So what ends up happening first? Uh, the laser pointer does not allow me to click. Okay, very good. So first part, of the, it's important to note that the fungicides themselves aren't mutagenic. I mean, they're not going to create superheroes and they're not going to create super pathogens. The path, the mutations that occur are sort of natural and pre-existing. Just there's all sorts of error and sort of copying and reproduction. And this error is what ends up generating the mutation or some stray UV rays. Maybe there's a big hole in the ozone layer over your orchard and, you know, you get your marcinina gets a little too much and one of the nine billion spores that's sitting on a leaf and then it becomes mutant. And these mutations don't often occur that much. And we'll show this cute little um, a purple in there is our mutation of the day. And then the application of the fungicide doesn't make this thing show up as we talked about before, but it's going to select for it. And you might be like, uh oh, um, one thing shows up. And then the next thing you know, what you have in the second season is because of the, the fungicide is out there and it happens to have resistance to fungicide A, everything else now has resistance. And so that's what ends up happening. And so your goal is to, when these things emerge, to not let this establishment happen. And that's sort of phase two. And that's where the fungicide um, gets involved. So what else have we learned? Particularly in the, uh, it seems that in the tree fruit world, in the medicine, in the vet world, the more filthy the operation, the bigger the problem. So it's a lot of it has to do with population size and how much of the pathogen is out there. And when we talk about managing, doing all the cultural control stuff, it's just going to take this population size that might be large and make it look small. And if you're going into the season with a high pad count and something like apple scab, you might be in trouble. So if there is a mutation occurring every so many isolates, if you have a large population, the probability is going to be higher that you have a couple of these things emerging. And then when you put your fungicide on, trouble occurs. And then it all goes pretty uh, bad from that point. You've got a big population. However, if you don't have a lot of apple scab, you don't have a lot of fire blight in the orchard, and the lower probability it might not even happen at all. If there's just so few spores or so few bacteria out there that are not going to get selected, um, something might you know, never occur. There might not be enough there for the, that mutation frequency to actually occur and have something have resistance to your uh, material of interest. And in that case, it gets really tiny. And then in, in that particular instance, uh, you may end up eliminating the population just by rotating materials. And that's kind of what you want to do. If you can go in with the cleanest orchard or the cleanest planting of whatever you're happen to be doing, especially if it's applied fungicides more than once in the cereal world, it's one to none. And so that's how things get, uh, there's only one uh, selection event, so to speak, and we have multiple in many instances where you're going strawberries, where you're going cherries, where you're doing apples in the case of what most people are getting into. And with those couple of things in mind, we'll start our journey with antibiotic resistance and we'll go through this fairly, yeah, fairly long time. Oh, yeah, we got a long time left. Yep. And then we'll sort of creep in the fungicide resistance. We've done a lot of work over the years in antibiotic resistance. And a lot of this work has uh, been done by Anna Wallace and some of the, the other preceding students as well. I'm going to talk about three phases, uh, just basics. Oh, how do we use antibiotics for fire blight? How should we do it? Um, what streptomycin resistance in New York look like and um, a little bit of antibiotic use and how our use practices uh, end up affecting resistant development or not and in many instances. And we'll talk about some of Anna's research and some of her predecessors research as well. Antibiotics and tree crops have been around since the 1950s and one of the first ones, as you can imagine, was there for Arwenia and that streptomycin and fire blight. But since then, you've got a, a lot of other ones showing up, but there aren't that many. You've got basically oxytetracycline and apple and pear. It can be peach and nectarine for bacterial spot of apricot. And if you're on Long Island, you struggle and you're growing stone fruit, this could be a really tricky one to do. Because it really like sandy um, area and sort of, sort of sandy temperate, that just little tiny um, damage to the fruit and you get these awful things. You're familiar with fire blight. And uh, blister spots, sometimes we don't see, but there are a few varieties that are highly susceptible to it. This is a pseudomonas, and it will get in there and will make your apples unmarkable as well. So we have the, we have the strep, we have oxytet, and then we have um, 
the third one, Kasuga Mice, in which we generally have fairly wide labeling for Fire Blight. And also, it's also good on other Xanthomonas of, of pepper and tomato. You can see there's only a few things that we're really going after. It's the Irwinias, of course, now the new citrus screening pathogen, uh, one Pseudomonas, and, um, and Xanthomonas are only the real species of bacteria that we're really targeting with these sorts of things. So there's not too many. None of these are used. I mean, in the old days when I was a child, I used to use tetracycline for acne, but I don't really think any of those things prescribed and met and vet anymore, just because resistance is so prevalent. What about fire blight? Well, um, this is fire blight. Nice. It's becoming worse now, it seems, in North America. What we're seemingly running into is these, you know, we have these nice, thin, young plantings that are highly productive, highly vigorous, great for light, great for aeration, great for managing disease, great for spraying, good spray coverage. You've got good um, possibility of movement of airflow and light into these canopies. They're small, but they're uh, very vigorous and they move very quickly. And we try to push them very quickly to get to that top wire. A lot of varieties are being bred for taste, color, and storability, and, you know, it's harder to get fire blight resistance in the mix. And then to make matters worse, it seems that we still get pretty cool bloom, which might uh, help with the initial phase of blossom blight, but we're starting to get a lot of hot weather towards the end of bloom and moving into petal fall. And if your young variety is just fairly young, it'll be out of sync with its bloom, and it'll probably end up flowering later. And I think this last summer we had a lot of 95 Fahrenheit days with a lot of heavy rains and can wreak havoc if you have a little bit of fire blight in your orchard. Uh, here's a nice shot here. We had a fairly devastating outbreak of fire blight at the USDA germplasm repository. Quite devastating with similar types of conditions that I mentioned. So this is sort of what we work with in terms of fire blight. Here's our disease cycle. It begins and it will begin soon as we sort of creep into, depending on where you are in the Northeast, it could start late March uh, or if you're really North, um, early May to late April. Um, you'll start things off with sort of these cankers that kind of ooze and that sort of will be our overwintering uh, bacteria. And so that's one of the reasons we recommend, recommend winter pruning to get rid of some of these things. You can prune in the summer, you can prune in the fall. This is all going to get rid of this potential canker. So you might not even see them all. The other thing we'll do is that once the buds break, it's often the indication that there's been enough warmth that maybe these cankers might ooze or start to become active. And then that's when you can sort of smother them with copper as well. And what these types of early inoculum reduction things do to the disease cycle, it all begins here at the open flowers. And that's when you also put on these antibiotics, biologicals, and bloom. You want to stop the bacteria from multiplying on the stigmatic surface, getting washed into a flower cluster, and then rolling down into the shoot of the plant. At that point, the bacteria will migrate, pop out of other things once the cells get so um, concentrated, and you'll see ooze, and then your insects can come and spread this around, and it will sort of follow the active growing tips. And it's not uncommon if you have a young, vigorous planting. I don't see any fire blight, but you might see fruit oozing as the um, bacteria make their way that way. It needs living tissue. So how these things kind of work is if you do a lot of sanitation, this sort of shifts your disease progress curve. It could start at zero and get to 100 if you do nothing. But if you do things like sanitation and pruning, it just sort of pushes that curve closer to, in our case for fire blight, we're really interested in, in petal fall. And you know, we may not say harvest, you could say terminal bud set when the plant stops growing, fire blight becomes less active. And so a lot of this inoculum reduction sort of theoretically just shifts your curve down. And even when you do the antibiotics, you're taking any inoculum that you didn't cut out and are trying to stop it from, get, from getting its progression. And so that just sort of takes your progress curve and shifts it all the way to the point of petal fall. We got no more flowers. And then in theory, you would be done as long as you manage it all. And what the other stuff does is if you start doing some defense inducers and post bloom, you, know, you can do pre bloom with the defense inducers and growth regulators afterwards. That will help sort of suppress your secondary cycle and um, what's like you hear about curves and stuff uh, presently, this will take your curve and then sort of flatten it as the secondary cycles um, become suppressed in this particular instance. You can't ooze if the fire of light is dead in the tissue. And so the combination of the two is like, oh, I shift my curve down there and I'm going to flatten it in the shoot light season. You get nothing at harvest instead of the 15 that I show in that instance. And so. Um, you can see where antibiotics are coming in right there in bloom and in the past we've used them post bloom as well as we start to get past the petal fall um, and moving into that area and we'll talk a little bit about what that does 
eventually. And so sort of an overview of what people are doing. You prune out, you put on your copper, hit them with the antibiotics and biologicals. You can get them with your defense inducers, your SARS, and sometimes your PGRs like prohex and ion calcium, try to slow the growth down. You're trying to make that apple tree um, unconducive for the pathogen to move through and grow in. And that's sort of the idea. The, the pathogen doesn't like to, it needs living hosts and it needs actively growing tissue in order to sort of invade and colonize the entire plant. And when you shut it down, it's shut down as well. And so the holy goal of all of these things, you can even go a little bit early with growth regulators if you want to try to slow the system down before it gets into bloom, just to try to stop the, the blossom blight and then eventual shoot blight that ends up killing the trees. So uh, what do we have? Some sort of background on these different things. Streptomycin, it's in a category of antibiotics that inhibits translation of proteins. So it's, it's, a, it's a cytal, it will really kill it's locally systemic in tissue, and you can typically see this by looking at the little yellow margins. If you put too much regulate in with it, and it can get into the tissues just a little bit, and you'll see them kind of get that sort of yellowing or strep burn, as they talk about. Now, resistance is possible. There's a whole bunch of different plasmids with so little tiny pieces of DNA that get taken into your bacterium and can be expressed, or you can get something right there in the old genome. But for the most part, we've been able to use it sustainably for 50 plus years and i think there's reasons for that and we'll talk a little bit about them as well oxytite oxy, oxytet sort of just will interfere with uh proteins responsible for growth in this case it's bacteria static so they don't die but fire like doesn't like to be dried out and so it works by you know you stop the bacterium from multiplying on the stigmatic surface the flowers dry out and you're doing good um you you really need something else to kill and in many cases it can just be air that will dry out the bacteria, or it could be something else you put on afterwards, but it's a bacteria static. So if you go to the doctor and you have a terrible bacteria infection and you find yourself in the getting an oxytetracycline class of drugs, the hope is, is that the bacteria will stop growing and your immune system will deal with it. I always feel a little bit disappointed when I get one that doesn't actually kill anything. So far, we don't see a lot of resistance in the fire blight pathogen or winia. But for the most part, we don't use it as much as some of the others, and we don't often feel that it's as effective, but it has can be getting it's getting pretty good these days, depending on newer formulations and newer products. Um, get some pretty good luck with it. Sometimes I don't get any more luck than I do with a biological. Sometimes it works really well. I think it depends on how it's being killed and if it's constantly raining on the bacteria and it's just static. Um, it could be there for a while. Um, this is a different one. It's a it is in the same class, Ksugamycin is in the same class as Strep, and it, um, but it has a different mode of action, thank goodness, and it was initially developed as a rice blast fungicide, and that's a fungal disease of rice, which is weird, and used as a protectant. The early days in the 80s, they looked at it for fire blight, and they suspended it because it was phytotoxic at the end. Um, however, uh, RIST has put out a new formula, 2L, and I think there might even be potentially even a 4L in the future. It's new and it's safe for apples, doesn't harm anything. And um, we can use it. Um, we, I guess, in, uh, we applied for a section three EPA label, Ksugamycin, and I think, God, is it that long ago we got this for fire blight finally, 2015, yeah, I think so. Yep, um, we tried to get the section three, we didn't get it. And then um, there was a federal label um, shortly after we tried to get the section, uh, the emergency exemption. We weren't able to get that, but, Thank goodness it was uh, registered federally in New York, and we were able to use it when we had some streptomycin resistant issues. The nice thing about this particular one is it's often ineffective against species that are important in medicine. The types of bacteria that causes medical infections in animal and people um, just doesn't work on them. It just doesn't, it's not like it's resistant, it just doesn't really work well on those. And that's why you'll see it on the Xanthomonas and the Arrhenia only. And we don't have a lot of Xanthomonas and Arrhenia bacteria causing infections of pets and people. So it's a good fit and it's a little bit better than strep in that regard. It's a little bit more agriculturally oriented. Um, not necessarily cheap, but a pretty decent one. All right, so let's talk about how do we do this? Well, the best way is for the most part, our growers and you and everyone, we really only put these out at bloom. And um, there's a perception by the, I guess, the federal government that farmers just spray these things whenever they want. But that's not the case, and for the most part, most and every grower I've ever worked with or discussed with or met with other extension and regional programs, we really use these um, in combination, and you should use them at bloom in combination with extension alerts 
and or forecasting tools. Don't just use one, um, use several. Also look at, you know, if you have a regional extension person, consider their analysis of whatever the disease forecasting tools are telling you. The second time they get used, and, and it hasn't happened in a while, so we haven't had a lot of hail, but in after bloom, when you're into pedophon, you got little small fruit and the hail event occurs. Sometimes streptomycin or antibiotics will go out. I don't think sucomycin is ever allowed after as it approaches petal fall, but strep had one. And strep also has a non-bearing um, label as well. And I'll talk a little bit about some of these selection studies that we've looked at for strep resistance and casugamycin resistance and the epiphytes. You spray it on trees after bloom, what happens? And you do get selection for strep resistance and other bacteria floating around your orchard after three applications. However, um, in a more recent study we've done, and you, we can look at some of that, if we have time, and I'll always check my time. Oh God, we have tons of time. Yep, the endophytes, the bacteria inside the plants aren't affected. There's always a little bit of fear that that systemic activity of strep will get inside the um, leaves and then cause trouble and sort of non-targets in the soil and in the plants. And the same with the epiphytes. Are we generating resistant monsters that are gonna go around and cause trouble? So we'll talk a little bit about some of those studies briefly. And then this is an example of the new NUA 3.0 system as a cougar blight model in it and a um, EIP based model in it as well, very similar to the Mary Blight um, program. And so that uses two of them. You can choose which one you want. You can regard both, but I usually think about it, consider everyone else's thoughts and uh, uh, use both as well. There's a lot of different model choices and choices for systems. And, but that's the subject of a completely different talk. So again, where do we do this um, fire blight forecasting? It just really, what it tells you is it's like, how favorable is it for blossom blight infection? You don't actually tell you what's actually happening. It's just like a high risk warning. It's like when you're driving across um, the area and you're going through a major city and it gives you a traffic warning or an accident warning. Let's think about it like that. Don't necessarily think about it. You're going to get into an accident, but think that you're in a situation where things can get really conducive for infection. And um, it generally turns out that it's the most cost effective. And if you're environmentally conscious, it's the most responsible way to use the antibiotics. Just use them when they're favorable. Don't put them out on a calendar schedule. There's a lot of options and they're getting easier and easier to use with less and less effort. And if you don't wanna to listen to all of your regional extension people, you can sort of just look at the models themselves and make your own choices. And there's a lot to choose from. And this is what we always um, say. And this is, seems to be what people do as we sort of, uh, when we go in for the antibiotics, we use the models to guide the timing. Obviously, if you're seeing something in your orchards that suggests with your own daily schedule and the amount of rain that's happening, that you should apply X, Y, or Z on one of those days, you should definitely do it. And the model is just telling you when regional conditions are favorable. You know when the conditions of your orchard are at highest risk. All right, so let's, we're well, moving away from that and we're gonna creep on in. Let's talk about what we found in streptomycin resistance in New York. All right, so early on in, uh, we had a, there was an early instance of 2002, there was this, I will abbreviate it, SMREA for streptomycin resistant or Winnie Amalabra, which is the fire blight bacterium, detected at two neighboring orchards in Western New York. Um, it's the first time we ever had, to our knowledge, the strep resistance in New York. It looked like it originated from uh, Michigan. The two orchard owners promptly eradicated the orchards and took a, uh, we believe it took a lot of the problem away. I hadn't really checked for a long time after that, and it really wasn't until very, um, like a, um, very intrinsically motivated scientists like Debbie Breath and Juliet Carroll, um, once we just started detecting this stuff again, they really went out and they took it on themselves to collect tons and tons of samples so we could get a really good picture of what's happened. And once this 2011 outbreak occurred in a nursery and then they uh, went around and aggressively collected lots of samples, our lab was involved in processing them. And we really got a real big in-depth look at what was happening in the region. And you really don't know um, what's happening unless you're testing hundreds of samples. It's still kind of a a guessing game. It's just like with testing in the current situation, the places that test the most often find the most positives. And, and that's when they start to occur. And then in 2011, we found three of seven nearby locations. And then we've done a lot of surveying from 
2012 to 2020, we look at a lot of high risk sites. A lot of this was happening in Western New York. And then, you know, we started with the high risk places and then we started looking at any farm with noticeable fire out fire blight outbreaks and we started pulling thousands of isolates from um, you know almost 200 commercial sites looking at a lot of things not many places had strep resistance but identifying it early allows you to take action um, so one thing that's really interesting about it we wanted to find out where all these strains coming from is it one big strain is it different ones um, what's happening and this is a cute picture of the Irwinia genome which is very boring until you notice that it contains the resistance genes for strep and other stuff on it and potentially copper. There's another little cute picture. This is what a plasmid. It's like sort of a satellite genome that sort of gets stuck in there and it can do um, various things for um, the bacteria that happen to have it. This one can't really get passed around. So if you find this particular bacterium with this particular plasmid, you know that someone has moved it, which is kind of interesting. This is some of the things that you can do, but other plasmids that could be here, not shown, can be moved around and can impart resistance to antibiotics and even stuff like copper. So one of the other things that we begin to look at, we've tried to look at this different way. There's so much homology between all the strains. We begin to look at a CRISPR profiling system. There are a lot of these CRISPRs, you might hear about them being used to genetically engineer organisms, but for the most part, they're part of a bacterial immune system. And they just have these repeats and they have these little spacers. And this is sort of what we'll be looking at in our instances. We'll be looking at different spacer profiles and repeats. And you, there's a lot of them and there's a lot of possibilities. And they're in three different areas. If you're here, here the CRISPR-Cas9 system, that's the transgenic system. And then they get stuck in these little region, repeat space, repeat space, or repeat. And it gives us this huge pantheon of loci and potentially different uh, genetic determinants from which we could begin to look at these strains. So that's interesting, but um, only at a very cursory level. And this is what it gives us this huge, unique fingerprint. And there can be as many as 400 and 600 different types of space or profiles. And from these, if you ever hear us talking about a CRISPR pattern, um, this is what it is. There's that CRISPR region one, and we generate a pattern for that. We generate a pattern for the second one. And the little baby one at the end is only has a very few patterns in it, and only one of them is fire blight. So if you didn't know if you had fire blight, you could just sequently, easily sequence this little chunk here and determine um, if it was fire blight or something very similarly related. And so if you ever see a pattern, they come in three numbers. And this will let you sort of give your strain its own uh, name, so to speak. In this case, we generate this crystal profile. So how do we do the whole process? Um, we collect samples or um, excellent other scientists in your region like Mike and Julie and everyone will collect samples for us. Or maybe even you'll send some in directly and you'll bring them in. You will then isolate the pathogen. Um, sample collection, isolate the pathogen. It might look like this. It makes a cratering morphology. We'll use a sort of selective uh, media then we'll type for antimicrobial resistance. It could be casugamycin, it could also be streptomycin. And we'll do phenotyping, which means does it grow in the presence of it? And then we'll do genotyping. And that's a more slow process that takes uh, more of the winter and time off where we like, what kind of mutation does the isolate have if it's resistance? And then if we're really feeling aggressive, this is kind of expensive, but we can sequence the strain, particularly like let's say a new strain that's resistant emerges in Orange County. Um, you might want to know, hey, did that come from Western New York, or is that something completely different? And so that's why we do these sort of things, so we can watch them move around. And then they all get QGIS mapped, and these are cute little maps as sort of shown here. And generally the red ones are the strep resistant ones, and you can kind of see in the background. Um, so in the early days, um, when we started hitting around the um, sort of early times, so that 2011 to 2014, 32 isolates at about 19 different farms and it's fairly much um, restricted. You had a couple of different strains. This is the original strain here from the 2002 epidemic. It was still creeping around in the region. But what's interesting about it is there's so many other sensitive strains around and about. And one of the other things that we've come to realize is that if a resistant strain and a sensitive one in the same orchard shares a profile, it might suggest that something in that particular orchard profile uh, orchard operation allowed for the selection of resistance if you have both resistance and sensitive ones and this sort of chunky category down here shows places that had a strain like 47 27 4 27 38 and it would have both resistance and sensitive components 
meaning that it probably was selected on site. Anything with this one, which is fairly prevalent now in the region, and we've watched it move all around, um, is uh, most likely from probably some original introductions left over from 2002. But these new ones were probably created on site. 2014 was interesting because we kept surveying, but everyone was clean. Um, when people found these strip resistant isolates, they eradicated trees, they started rotating materials, they did everything that one would do for good IPM practice, and they were gone for many years. We haven't found any until 2019 and then 2020, and now creeping into 2021, there's a few more, and it turns out that like nearly everything that's um, resistant is this one strain, and it's back, and it showed up again on, you know, we had a nice period of nothing, and now it's creeping back again on 11 farms. But for the most part, it wasn't like there were old farms that we kept retesting and finding, oh no, it's back on an older farm. It was farms that had never been um, profiled before. And so if you've never looked, you know, you, you really don't know. And it wasn't like, um, and these are all sort of new discoveries at new different places, but it's around. And the one thing that's really interesting about this farm this isolate is that it um, has that plasmid and that's where the resistance lives on that little piece of DNA and it can't be moved beyond the bacteria very easily. And so in that particular instance, that means this one thing has sort of just been passed around on, uh, you know, it could be an infected piece of material, it could be propagation material, it could be from something else, but it has definitely gotten around the region and it's unlikely to have been picked up by insects or carried in clouds but uh, we're moving it around and that's where things get rather interesting if you can start to consider home nurseries uh, and stuff like that as well if one of these gets into a home nursery thing can get pretty crazy you can kind of look and then see this is a more recent update of strains and of course you can see this big amr blob here there in ontario and wayne and the the that particular one is making a, a huge proportion of what's escaping but what you see down here aren't resistant ones but this is just diversity. And if you start to head towards Clinton County and sort of Eastern New York, you see a lot of diversity. Look at all those different colors. You have a lot of strains, but not all of them or any of them are um, resistant at this point. So it's very interesting. So that one original strain, once it gets in a region and starts to get selected and moved around, yeah, it can persist over, gosh, 2002. That's like 18 years. That's a while. So what can we learn from all this? Um, we have all the infrastructure it's in place to track and monitor um, antimicrobial resistance. And a lot of it suggests that it's one strain that's getting moved around. There are a few that were um, created on site, but in many instances, those look like have been squashed and they've never come back up again after that original. Um, and it's not so much we had an outbreak, it's that we had in-depth testing. And I think that's what really led to it. And those, um, and all the extension, um, regional extension people who are leading the charge to get testing now, are just doing us a service because we can find these things and then squish them. It seems to be localized to Western New York, and it's not like re-emerging at old farms. It's new farms for the most part that haven't been tested before. And so when we go back and when we look at farms that had problems and before, they're often able to just sort of get rid of it. And on individual farms, it's just a few isolates among several. And in that instance, it, the possibility of sort of having it lose out by rotating materials is indeed there. Let's see how we're doing. All right, 44 minutes. Wow, we still got some time. Eastern New York appears to be streptomycin, Irwinia resistance free, but we might have found um, one potential one in Clinton County in 2021. We're going to do an in depth molecular discovery. Uh, I have a student that's very good and knows how to do this stuff. However, the Cornell system insists that they take classes for two years, which has pretty much. Um, I shackled her away from being able to serve our industry for the most part and stuck down there um, in the various uh, graduate school compliance aspects of the of her uh, career. But anyway, we're back in the summer and um, looking at some of these um, extra ones from 2021. Nearly all the strains have this unmovable plasmid borne resistance. There was a few that had some on the chromosome kind of gone now. We don't see them anymore. So it's that one real big troublemaker that's sort of out and about. Um, and the interesting thing that's really that we found is there's a lot of diversity in eastern New York. You know, um, in that case, if you have a lot of other organisms and strains out there, it might be harder for invasives. It might be harder for this resistant one to sort of get established and stuff like that. Okay, finally, let's we're gonna sort of maybe speed through this. Oh, we have a lot of time, don't we? 
Yeah, it's a never ending thing. Let's talk about what happens when you use antibiotics and how it might affect things. And um, the long story short is that using antibiotics in your orchard is not necessarily evil and it doesn't necessarily create resistance. And so that's sort of uh, what we're going to talk about. Uh, it's not a really popular thing to say, but um, it's really not necessarily a bad practice um, as much as it might be criticized in the public eye. So there's a lot of negative implications, uh, you know, the idea being that um, growers are spraying these antibiotics and they're going to get into human pathogens and then get into livestock and cattle and into us and or they're going to get into the water systems and um, we're going to get infected by them. But for the most part, we can really only um, give strep resistance and oxytet and um, that's not a lot of what we're seeing in um, antibiotic resistance and so. The idea, um, one of the bigger concerns that sort of goes through the, the group who works on this type of stuff is that the excessive post bloom use, not necessarily the bloom time use, but the stuff that happens afterwards is leading to resistance problems, or is it hurting the microbial communities in apple orchards? And there's some yes and there's some no, and we'll sort of go through what we've done. And um, when do you use post bloom? Well, it's after a trauma event, wham. You can uh, recommend it 24 hours after trauma event to sort of lock this down with streptomycin before the end comes. And the other thing that you can do is that it also has a 60 day PHI in bearing orchard. But if you're just planting a nursery block um, or a newly established orchard, you're not going to fruit it. And you can just keep using it. And um, it's nice to have the proxidion calcium. It will just quickly slow vigor and stop the fire blight from migrating past the initial site of infection, which could only be a few cells deep, but it also is stopping vigor and it really helps stops establishment of new orchards. And so we've done a lot of work to try to see how we can optimize that tool. But at the same bottom line, if you want your plants to grow, you can't stop them from growing. But if they're growing, they're getting killed by fire blight. Hence, this is where we got to save the orchards. Um, if you lose them all, you don't really have uh, operation anymore. Copper's great um but it can injure young fruit not bearing you can just keep going with copper and it's a protectant and also is under the public scrutiny for completely different reasons because it's a sort of toxic heavy metal type material and um it's not popular as well um strep is locally systemic and it is kind of an easy situation easy solution and you might use it in a panic when orchards are dying to stop the spread i mean if the whole thing is oozing and you, you're gonna why not? I'm going to lose everything anyway. I might as well attempt to stop the spread. And amongst the scientists, there's this sort of dogma. You don't see it a lot in the literature, you know, not supported, but there is the, the thought and feeling and belief that sometimes you might see some evidence of this, but it's just these post bloom applications, the stuff that's happening now is leading to the selection of strep resistant isolates. And so one of the things that we thought we'd do was like, well, wait a minute, why don't I just keep making applications of streptomycin and casugamycin on trees that have Irwinia amylavra and a bunch of other non-target bacteria that are hanging around in the phylosphere or on the leaves and seeing what happens. I mean, in this particular case, I don't have to do surveys. I can just make the applications ourselves. One of the things that we sort of found, what's in the epiphytes are Pantoia glomerans, which is a very similar species to Arrhenia amylavra. It used to even be thought of and used as a biological control. So it's floating around out there. And there's a lot of Pseudomonas. And the interesting thing about these two is that many of these also have a plasmid with the same strep gene resistance genes as Arrhenia on them. And some instances it's believed that they have plasmids that can move around. But you really have to hop species if you want to go from this thing to fire blight. But it is very closely related potentially it could hurt happen what's on the inside of an apple tree we don't really know it's um it was largely unknown so what we ended up doing is we started um at bloom and we just started making successive applications at seven day animals three five and ten and then we started collecting leaves we did an old uh 15 year old ida red started at bloom and we did a 10 year old ida red beginning sort of at post bloom and we did casugamycin, we did um, streptomycin, that's an agromycin, casumin 2L, and we wanted to see what happens um, for the most part. So we collected leaves, we sonicated them, we did dilution plating, we did morphological characterization. Okay, what is what? What bacteria do we have here? 
and then we did some molecular characterization and you know and at that point that was the epiphytes so very similarly uh, many years later about four or five let's, let's start looking at the endophytes we knew that strep could get inside leaves because sugamycin really can't so in that case we focused on streptomycin and we put regulate in with it we did three five and ten we did gala 15 year old gala two year old gala really tiny tall spindle ones we hit it with agromycin we threw in some serenade optine we put in some quava in there for comparisons to organics what do these do to the bacteria inside the plants um and we uh for the most part what we started looking at in terms of the epiphytes were these things and it's no big surprise it was what we thought um pantoia pseudomonas and this has been supported by numerous other scientists some other weird ones show up but to be perfectly honest what's not on the leaves of um apple plants when you're spraying them even if fire blight is active in the orchard as it was erwinia we didn't really find it there's so many other things out there it and it turns out that if you do read in the literature it doesn't like to live on the surface of leaves and so spraying your leaves all summer long with streptomycin isn't really going to magically create um, Erwinia amylovra. It's not even there to really get blasted. It is on an active fire blight strike, but it's not living on your leaf tissue. And in that case, when we did it, there's no, there's no Erwinia up there. We did find some interesting things, though, um, for the other two, this Pantoia and the Pseudomonas. And as we started spraying more and more, the Pantoia goes down and the Pseudomonas goes up. And this likely in an Orchard 1 and 2 in 2014, and it likely reflects the difference in effectiveness of this particular material. Okay, that's great. No fire blight out there. And these other things are sort of going up and down in their populations as we're moving. So more Pseudomonas, less Pantoe, probably less natural competitors of fire blight. What happens in 2015? Doing it again, had this big spike of a bunch of weirdos, but it was a really wet year. Same sort of trend, the more we spray, the, these other species there. Arrhenia is rarely found, so it's not really there to get blasted. In general, if we just look at anything that has streptomycin resistance, ah, you know, our orchards are just chock full of other epiphytes that have strep resistance. And the more we spray, they quickly ramp up very quickly, particularly in this year, it was like, whoa, going from 42, just sort of zooming on up and it's sort of 90 um 95 depending on what year and what orchard you're looking at you can kind of see here is a really low year but even after three applications all the other things floating around the orchard have streptomycin but none of those things are irwinia none of those things cause fire blight but they're out there and it is kind of scary so what we found was little of that these other two species seem to increase and decrease with strep use but you know it might impact your ability to naturally compete with the irwinia and anything becomes quickly streptomycin resistance once you start spraying it. Um, once you get about two or three sprays, it just ramps up quickly if it's not there. So what about the casugamycin? Well, this is a little more interesting. Um, there's no resistant casugamycin resistant Irenia floating around, same thing. The trend was reversed. The more you sprayed that, the Pantoia goes up and the Pseudomonas dies. So it turns out the Pseudomonas is very sensitive to casugamycin and will get killed. Um, pretty quickly. So their numbers, the sort of proportions of populations are going up and down. But what was particularly cool, the more we sprayed casugamycin, the more strep resistant epiphytes just begin to decline. So anytime you use that one, it, you know, it's not really giving those strep resistant epiphytes a chance to go. And so over time, and like this one in particular, dropped off the face of the earth almost by um, application number 10, which was kind of exciting. And the one thing that is kind of unnerving is that in the original days, around the time the dinosaurs and fire blight was first around, um, it's believed that this other one, this Pantoia glomerans, the other one, transferred a plasmid over here into what we know as the air, or any amylavra. And then that, this little tiny gene piece, bopped off this plasmid and went on to the one that we get moved around in the state that seems to be the primary cause of stuff. And so it's kind of a scary thought to keep high proportions of strep resistant members of this, because what if they have other plasmids that can creep over to Erwinia? Thank goodness Erwinia isn't actually on leaves. So this must be a very rare event, but anything that increases that one is particularly troublesome. And Kasugamycin really knocks it down. Um, you might ask like, well, is there a decrease in you know this decrease that we saw with doing a lot of Kasugamycin? Is there a fitness cost? Nope, not really. Um, these little plasmas really don't um, compromise the ability of the, the pathogen to do stuff. They just keep punching on. 
So what do we know about this? We never detected any exogamycin resistant isolates, um, none present. The, um, what's nice about it is it decreased with um, uh, the pseudomonas and that pseudomonas is one of the things that causes blister spot of apple shown here on the right. Could we use this to help get a little bit of blister spot management? The problem is, is you're not allowed to use it after petal fall, but petal fall is one of the key timings to get rid of blister spot. And so if you were thinking of, if you have a blister spot, maybe on New York one or another uh, Fuji or something of that nature, and you get plagued by it every now and then in wet seasons, if you want to finish your final fire blight spray with Kasugamycin, you might pick up a little bit of this as well. And the sad thing about this is we've looked for this and this particular species that causes the Pseudomonas syringi, causes blister spot. It's pretty widely prevalent and it's never been sort of locked out. Like we've been able to kind of squish the strep resistant fire blight out, but not the other one. And for the most part, you can use it to manage a bunch of other bacterial diseases. We won't dwell on that. Let's creep into what we learned with the endophyte. This is a pretty short story, and I'm going to probably move past it. We do a lot of other things very similarly, and then we went to um, second gen sequencing and bioinformatics to sort of characterize things. And from this, we did a couple of different things. We asked the questions, okay, who's there? And did it reduce um, abundance or richness with inside the plant? And did it change the different communities inside the, um, in the apple tree? All these applications. And so we did all the applications like with three, five, and 10. And you can see it looks like it actually went up to nine in this case, not 10. And you know, there's a bunch of different things, but what's not detected in there is the fire blight bacterium. And we did two different orchards, uh, the two galas, and nothing, you know, no, no real standouts, just a bunch of strange bacteria live inside the plants. And then relatively tiny in abundance. There weren't very any bacteria in there. So that's great. Well, what about the microbiome of the tree, do I need to worry about this? This alpha diversity will tell you, do I just have tulips or do I have a whole bunch of wildflowers inside after using a bunch of strep? And then we did a different um, bioinformatic analysis. Like, oh, is the community inside this treatment a lot different than the other? And we ran all of these different things. And um, this is the only year that we actually found that diversity was suppressed. And it was between the three strep treatment and the untreated. However, spraying strep nine times did not impact the diversity at all, or one time either, or doing Quava or um, Serenade. And so what that tells you is that some other factor must be going on, because you would think if it was suppressing diversity, the nine strep would be doing it. And we saw the same thing in 2019 as well. We also looked at, oh, is the community different because we use streptomycin? And you can kind of see the little dots are all over the place. But here um, you can see clusterings. And it turns out that what's in the endophytes is basically related to what's in the soil underneath your orchard anyway. And the treatments that we were doing don't really impact it at all. So um, in that case, you can see that orchard is very significant. Well, the treatment doesn't really matter. Spray strep nine times, spray strep three times. It's wherever the orchard is that determines what the microbiome is doing. Same thing we sort of found in 2019 as well in that particular instance. So what do we know? The stuff on the inside, they're not really affected by streptomycin. And it doesn't make for a very exciting story, but it does tell you that you're not doing anything bad by um, applying these materials to your orchard, particularly to the inside of the tree. There's a lot of concern about the um, impact to the flora and fauna, but you know, where does the, uh, where, do, where do all the endophytes come from? They usually come from the ground and they get taken up by the roots. And that's what most of those are. So even when you're spraying these things, you're really not affecting the community in the area. It's whatever the orchard's planted on that seems to be the biggest source of it. And um, for the most part, um, if you're an opponent of antibiotic use, sadly, this just adds to the uh, body of scientific literature that says that, you know, uh, management of fire blight with antibiotics is sustainable if we keep doing it in these responsible ways. So what do we know now? Never been streptomycin resistant fire blight recovered after excessive use. We've tried, we've have it out there, nothing happened. Doesn't seem to promote passing of plasmas between species. I guess there's just none present for selection. Never ever found a sugamycin resistant epiphyte ever. So I guess there's none there. There's it's not being passed around none present. There's been a few found in um, non-target soil in Michigan. But that's about it. And the community structure. So all the, you know, the concern of like, oh, my, I mean, you can sort of shift these things, the epiphytes around, but you're really only shifting between the abundance of two species for the most part. Everything else is miscellaneous. 
on the leaves. Um, and there's differential sensitivity in how these things are affected. And we might be able to use this to capitalize on managing blister spot in rough years with Kasumin. Um, and with that, we're going to move on. We're going to get into fungicide resistance, I think. Let's talk about scab with the rest of our 27 minutes. And well, uh, we are taking a break. I just wanted to comment that it's uh, really good news that the Indophys communities are not affected, which is um, yeah. sort of um, expected a little bit, as we already know the you know the uh, once the pathogens are in the in the leaves uh, internally, you know it doesn't really work to use streptomycin to control the exactly uh, yeah. uh, once they are already in, in internally. So so you know once um, so it seems like uh, it's a good news that those antibiotics wouldn't be able to penetrate uh, as deep to um, really affect the um, the Indophyta communities uh, yeah. in in those. Um, um, yeah, it was really interesting. In, in that study, we had someone wanted to promote the article, and they'd accidentally switched all the conclusions around. <laughs> we had to, because, you know, uh, <laughs> it's like, no, 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 it's not, not that at all. Yeah, it's yeah, very interesting it, how it goes. Yeah, yeah so it seems like the, the takeaway message for me is that as far as we responsibly use the, um, mm -hmm. you know, these antibiotics, uh, we can uh, probably preserve this uh, to be effective. Uh, for a, for a, a prolonged period of time, uh, as far as uh, you yeah. know, it's not excessive use, and given that the ecology yeah. is uh, still balanced, uh, even with limited usage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we get some quite diversity in nine strep applications. Sometimes it was some of the other things, and so I think it just matters where the tree is and what it's taking up in the soil. Yes, it's very interesting. So, Cole's Quan and Carrick, sorry yeah. to jump in there. We do have a couple questions in the chat box that I thought we could address before we move on to the, the fungicide portion okay. of your talk. Sure. So we had a question early on. Why is there a limitation on the number of sprays per type if the fungicide is not causing the mutation? Uh, maybe you'll address this shortly. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, the thoughts? limitation is that we don't over select for it. Um, oh, yeah. So it won't cause the mutation. But if you still had one mutant out there and you did four sprays in a row, the chances are that it, it might grab it and then run with it, and then it might be selected. Yeah, so the mutation might occur by UV light, random reproduction mistake and copying DNA. And then if we apply, oh, DMI, 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 all in a row, or group seven, group seven, group seven, um, or more, group seven, eight times. I don't think the number four has ever been validated scientifically, but it is, it is a good practice. Okay, thanks, Carrick. Yeah. We do have another. With proper sanitation and chemical management, is it possible mm -hmm. to entirely eradicate fire blight from an infected orchard over time? I mean, I'd, I'd say so, but there are uh, rosaceous crops and trees floating in the woods that it might it might come back again. It does seem terribly endemic. I've never seen anyone ever eradicate it. I mean, the best thing to do would be to um, go back in time when we didn't have global warming and live in Peru, New York, and you might not ever see fire blight again. Or on Long Island, it was sort of, sort of gone for, not not there. And I think once it gets in, it always is going to be there a little bit. Quan, any other thoughts on that? Based on stuff you've seen in your region, I think um, 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 it's hard to spot all those cankers that you people say. If you completely eradicated, you know how how do you define that? Uh, so I think um, as, as far as there are some living tissue, sometimes you know they can creep in, have some hidden cankers, and also the alternative host that you mentioned. You know, in the woods, yeah. there could be some uh, you know service berry, mountain ash. You know, they, they can also be um, reservoirs of the pathogens, yeah. and they can you can eradicate the in your orchard, but the, you know the insects can bring bring. Oh uh, yeah, from a neighboring field, yeah, yeah. or from the woods, yeah. And, and those those little cankers, I didn't talk about it in this one, but there are they're just numerous and they're hard to spot. And um, we did this one study where only inoculated maybe two trees and two hundred. And after the twenty twenty one couple rainstorms, even cutting everything out, you didn't see it. The whole orchard was swamped with with death. And so yeah, all it takes is one. So, Carrick, I got one more before we go on to yep. your next portion here. Uh, it seems the more I know, the murkier the water is getting. 
For the average grower that has always used strep during bloom and petal fall on yep. a schedule dictated by infection models, should we be worried about producing a strep resistant strain? I'd say no. I mean, if you're doing less than what I was showing as the as a gross mispractice, then I, I don't think you need to worry about it. What what you might worry about it, here's where to worry, is if you get trees from a home nursery, you know, oh, if I have a friend in an area, I have a friend in Southern Michigan or something, and they're making their own trees, and they'll sell them to you for a dollar a tree instead of 15. Don't do that. That's where trouble comes in. And this strain seems to be moved physically. So if you get your trees from a good place and watch them, you should be fine. And all of the nurseries are are um, very um, aggressive and um, doing a good job of trying to manage and keep fire blight down. And um, I mean, I've seen, uh, uh, I really like, I get all my trees from, um, what's the nursery that's up the, up the street from us? I can't even think about it now in sodas. And I've, I've never gotten a strep tree from them, no matter how, even if I tried. I mean, I don't ever get fired. All their trees are really clean. And um, yeah, I have not really, I've gotten a lot of good, Fire blight, but the fire blight that gets on those young nursery trees from reputable nurseries. Um, yeah, like wafflers is the one I get a lot from. And then I get a lot from um, 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 from Washington. It's never like, oh no, here's a Washington CRISPR isolate on those. Nope, it's always one from my area. But be careful with the, some of the nursery stuff if it's a home nursery. That's where things get tricky. Grow up your home nursery for yourself, but don't give it to anyone else. I think you'll be fine. All right, thanks, I Karen. Think. That's all the questions we have right now. All right. So a little bit of apple scab, just the system I'll talk about. I'm going to talk about some other work as well because there's some other lessons in there. We did a big thing for the onion group using some of the stuff we learned from apple scab. So a lot of these lessons we can learn or we can use for other things as well. Go There we go. A lot of susceptible cultivars, unless you've got honey crisp and you're probably, and you want to grow something, you probably have scab. And you could get 10 plus applications a year. It's not impossible, particularly in wet weather. And you know, if you get this on your fruit, it's over with. And the fruit can only be used for processing and no one can pay for the labor on that. And for scab, we've had this huge history of resistance that's reported for air nearly all single site fungicides. And you know, I started thinking about the comment about the four application program. In the old days, there was an idea that you could just sort of let the scab build up, drop four applications of DMIs on them, and just get rid of scab for the year. And I think there's sort of that sort of practice of maybe over-reliance on a few single-site chemistries. And to be fair, um, we only get one single-site fungicide chemistry every 10 years anyway. So when something new comes out, you might be tempted to use it more than four times particularly if the season starts to get long. And I think that's why they put that limit on those types of things. And there's also not just a limit on the four, it's that having that spacer fungicide in the middle, which seems to be really important for knocking down resistance. And for right now, um, I'm trying to get group seven resistance, trying to find it, I can't do it. We've done some studies, we'll show some of those and it's not showing up for the most part. And if you keep behaving, I don't think it will show up. Um, we're rotating in things that we've lost a resistance to. And um, it's like I said, it's farm specific. So if you don't have resistance to all four at your farm, you're probably gonna be fine for a long time. And I got a lot of different topics we can talk about here. We'll sort of braze through these. The first one being practical resistance, which is um, something really good to know for growers and something good to know for that growers should know when they're listening to extension people talk. And then we'll talk about curtailed use, multiple resistance, and some application practice as time permits. But we're blazing right along. Um, what is practical fungicide resistance? And so we have this group at the American Phytopathological Society that's this pathogen resistance committee, and we developed a definition. It's the point in which the pathogen is sufficiently resistant to a fungicide so that it results the failure of the commercially formulated product when it's used appropriately. So that means you go out there and you have enough members of that population that have resistance that if you make an application, it doesn't work. And um, so we've done a lot of this work over the years with Dan and Alan Biggs, Dan Cooley at UMass, and for nearly all the groups of the older fungicides, the group threes, DMIs, the QOIs, group 11, and even things like dotine. And so what we do is we take a lot of isolates from an orchard back in the days when we were able to pull this off. And we use a statistical test where we have like, okay, what's our known sensitive population? 
Okay, what's our resistance standard? If I go out and spray this orchard, that distribution of these isolates is such that the product is going to fail and I have a test population. So I'm going to statistically compare the response of these isolates to these two and see where it falls. And we have that reference standard where I've sprayed it. We know we have good coverage. We got, uh, we've seen a failure in disease after the product use. And um, we have these research plot, plots that we can sort of illustrate what it looks like when you use these under the wrong conditions. And so if you grab a test isolate, you get a bunch of leaves and we grow up the apple scab on a dose. Oh, okay, is this curve statistically the same as the sensitive? It's probably gonna work in your region. If it's statistically the similar to the resistant one, it could fail and you could get the same level of awful disease that we got in our test plots. It's even possible for it to be more resistant than the test population. And we've sort of seen these things. I'm gonna sort of just show the DMIs. We have a very similar story for the QOIs, which are the group 11s, use these on rust. They've been out since the 1970s and they're still coming out. We had Inspire and Flutriafol and Top Guard in 2010. And then we even have the, the Sevia presently in 2021. So we're still getting new ones, but they're great on rust. They're one of the few things that work really well on rust, powdery mildew and apple scab, and sometimes even the, uh, the bitter rots, depending on what species you have. And what these do is they kind of like are cholesterol inhibitors for fungi. So fungi need to make all these little spores and hyphae to cause an infection, and this stops them from growing for the most part. So they're kind of like a, a growth inhibitor, which means if they don't dry out on the surface of the leaf, they can activate again and continue going. And so they're not the type of fungicide you want to use to burn something out. So we can sort of skip the mechanism and get right down to it. A long time ago, Dan Cooley, Alan Biggs, and our team got together a little bit before even I got here, and we looked at a whole bunch of orchards in the New England, Mid-Atlantic, and Midwest, and 121, and then we all classified them, each one using their curve compared to the standard curves, and you can kind of see that over time for this mycobutanil, which is very popular for apple scab, so many, this is the percentage of orchards, so many were over the threshold and very few were sensitive. Interestingly, at the same time, we ran all the isolates on a, on a different fungicide, diphenaconazole, which is an Inspire that I still recommend, and the same isolates were sensitive to it. Um, and in this particular instance, it just seems that diphenaconazole packs so much of a more intrinsic punch on the apple scab that no matter how much resistant mechanism they're making, we don't know what it is, they just can't keep up with it. Oh, it looks like it's moving on its own, my favorite. Um, and so yeah, we have one that might be considered resistant to it. And that's why I still say, oh yeah, you can still keep using diphenaconazole. It's hard to find resistance to that one. And it's sort of a rate limiting process for these particular ones. So the story is different with the QOIs. It doesn't seem to go away and you can't get a better QOI that can out punch the apple scab because it's sort of a, a based on a mutation like the fire blight. But in this particular instance, if you get a better DMI or you increase the rate, you just sort of move things along. What it might look like, um, and what we sort of found over the years, this is sort of a, a trial that has a bunch of diphenaconazole, the mycobutanil. This orchard has practical resistance. And you can kind of see, whoa, this is the number of fruit that have um, apple scab on it. There's my untreated. We had a hot, dry year, and we had a cool, wet. You can see on the hot, dry year, you don't see as much resistance. Diphenaconazole is putting a good punch. Um, a program of full protectants does just fine. We have a dirtier orchard because we need to see differences. But in a wet year, wow you can really see that resistance going because it didn't give you any control whatsoever for some of these. You see a little bit from that fenbiconazole. One of the things that we noticed that is if you're going to see practical resistant, um, it really depends on the intrinsic activity of the fungicide that diphen is a really heavy hitter. And you can make, and I don't have the data, but if you increase the rate of mycobutanil enough, you can make it look just like the diphenaconazole um, curve as well. And so that means you just sort of up the rate and you can make it a, make that resistance apparently go away. It also depends on the weather. If it's a dry year, you might not ever see it. This is Macintosh. It gets apple scab very easily. In the same plots are Cortlands, and they can be right next to each other. And like, depending on if it's a dry year, you might not even see it. So what we've noticed about practical resistance is that it shows up by cultivar susceptibility, and it shows up by ac intrinsic activity of the fungicide and weather, all of these things impact whether or not you'll see it. It's almost like it's its own disease triangle. And so if you have Honeycrisp, you can have resistance to several um, um, uh, fungicides in your various pathogens, but you might not ever know it if the weather wasn't conducive and Honeycrisp doesn't get a lot of apple scab. You just be like, well, totally fine. 
and you don't really see it. So you might hear from an extension specialist, oh yeah, your orchard is resistant to, you know, has resistance to DMIs in it or QOIs. And a similar type study has been done for the QOIs as well. But at the same time, if you stack the deck by, you know, keeping the environment correct and picking a good cultivar, you might not ever know. But at the same time, could just be end up wasting your money by applying diphenaconzole or mycolabutina and you didn't know it because the fungus is resistant to it and you're actually managing everything with cultural control, um, which is kind of scary. But um, testing is indeed possible. So that's sort of what we've talked about with these DMIs. You can break whatever metabolic level of power the apple scab can do to deal with these fungicides. And seems to be a big interaction between the chemistry, the susceptibility and the environmental conditions. You can modify that susceptibility and environment you can make the apparent resistance appear to go away. We have similar stories for that, and particularly dodine. And I'm going to sort of jump on ahead to the dodine just a little bit, and it might sort of, yeah, we're running out of time fast, aren't we? Yeah, looks like it comes and goes quickly. It's been a lot of fun. Well, let's talk about this one. Dodine was something we had in the 60s. Good activity against cherry leaf spot and apple scab. And we don't really know how the mechanism resistance occurs, but you know, in the 1960s, about 12 years later, um, we had widespread resistance. And it was probably for multiple applications of the same material over and over again. And when we were doing the studies with uh, Dan Cooley and all, we started looking, spot checking, but we didn't find a lot. Yeah, there's some from 24 to 26. And then as we kept doing the survey, we kept finding fewer and fewer isolates of dodine resistance. And we can't even, much less an orchard, we can't even find a, an isolate with it now. It just sort of went away over time, but people weren't using it and people were scared to use it. Again. But now um, we often wonder, was it just sort of slow selection or is it some kind of slowed recovery? Or perhaps at this time when we were really seeing a decline in dodine, we were um, seeing, uh, we were selecting for a different type of resistance. We were probably selecting for the DMIs at this particular instance and those dodine isolates, which weren't the same, they weren't linked on the same individuals, sort of just petered off and we started picking up um, the DMIs again. And with that, uh, we can still use dodine now. It's restricted to two sprays, principally because I think they're concerned that the resistance could come back. We did a lot of studies in Geneva, spraying it a bunch, four or five times after petal fall, and never saw a problem. And we don't necessarily know why it's two sprays before pink. Um, you can use it in the summer when you have an emergency, but you shouldn't because it's not labeled. But it's never really created any more resistance. And so we did a lot of studies later on, and we haven't ever seen it show up again. But it seems that over time, 20 or 30 years, if you start selecting for something else, you might not see resistance to something you had. However, the group one, the benzimidazoles, they have a mutation in the genome. We still see that even in our orchards in Geneva after 30 years. Whatever that is seems to be heavily entrenched. So what it might mean is that be careful. Um, uh, catch it before it happens. And I think now, as we're starting to rotate between 11, 3, and 7s, um, you can kind of avoid a lot of this. So for those of you who are seeking credits, please go ahead and fill out the poll. We'll uh, start taking any other questions. And Carrick, you have a few more things to go over before we're all set here? Um, we, we can, we can either, either one. I mean, I can talk more or we can just start doing some questions. Well, I did notice that, uh, so Dave Rosenberger is actually here with us today and he popped a, a comment into the chat regarding the eradication of Fireblade. I don't know if you saw that and maybe wanted to nope. comment well, You can on tell that? me what it said. <laughs> I, I sure. So uh, David said that with regard to eradicating fire blight from an orchard, he has seen population production regions in the Hudson Valley that had severe fire blight for several years, but that within several years uh, appeared to be free of fire blight and remained so for a decade or more, even in the absence of strep. However, he says he suspects that eradicating blight may be less feasible in regions with highly concentrated production, in other words, more neighboring orchards. Yeah. That uh, seems fairly reasonable to me. I could imagine if you're fairly isolated that and you don't have any other junk trees in the woods, I, I, I would I would say it would be entirely possible. I mean, I don't think I mean there have been other regions that haven't used strep for quite some time. He like does finish in, with, uh, please note that he would never consider an orchard or area to be free of fire blight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I would never take the chance either. It's just, you know, I guess it's kind of like 
if you're out on the desert roads and you're driving at 120 miles an hour, you don't see anyone for three hours, you could probably take your seatbelt off the entire time. It's just that that uh, it's not advisable because that one time someone's coming around the corner. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I could see it. Yeah. So we do have a few more questions, Carrick. We can go through sure. these. Uh, your yep. thoughts on sulfur or biologicals for scab control? Uh, um, sulfur. I mean, they you can make it work. You just have to apply it very often. I would start with a less susceptible cultivar. <sighs> Um, it's, I would say the biologicals can more easily control fire blight than apple scab, particularly in our region. If you're getting a lot of wet weather and you're closer to the Pennsylvania border or in a more, it's just going to be really challenging. And, um, um, sulfur can be done. You just have to spray it a lot and, uh, the trees can suffer from excessive sulfur use. Um, that's what basically what I've noticed with it. I mean, I've got to the point where there are some orchards that I have to rate if I have a heavily sulfur program because people go into it and their eyes burn and it it's just painful. Um, it, it's entirely possible to do it. Um, you just have to spray often. And and the one thing is if you get a scab resistant variety, you may have one that's susceptible to cedar apple rust or marcinina and and then it's and it's all over with as well, just because sometimes those very aggressive pathogens just have a harder time being defeated by the the biologicals. Um, I do have a different talk that I'll be talking about at the Ontario Expo where we talk about how you might be able to pull it off, but it's not by using biologicals alone. Um, but that's sort of a different uh, different venue. Thanks, Carrick. We do have another question. How much cross resistance between Benlate and Topsin M? Seems like Topsin's still very effective, even though Benlate resistance presumed to be widespread. Well, they should have the same mechanism. Yep. And so maybe if um, you're using, uh, if Thompson is working for you, perhaps the population that you're testing it on has sort of migrated away. They sort of, they're both uh, group one fungicides and they share the same type of uh, mechanism. Yeah, we tried Thompson in in Geneva after, you know, my predecessor says it was gone for many years and it still didn't necessarily work well for us. It works well in other diseases, just not necessarily the apple scab. Maybe you have a non benamel resistant um, population. Thanks, Carrick. Uh, we have another question. Will apple scab build up resistance to captan? Um, let's see. Not necessarily, but I will show something else. It's not going to get resistance. One of the things that has been really kind of interesting that we've had in the past is we started doing this baseline sensitivity study for all the group sevens. And oh, here are the baseline isolates are really super uh, sensitive. One of the things that was really interesting that we found is that isolates that came from a heavily managed, heavily sprayed orchard with a variety of different fungicides, you can already see that in these culture plates are much less sensitive to the uh, to those particular materials, all of them. It's like, wait a minute, and there's no there's no mutations, there's no other things as well. They just grow. These isolates grow so much easily. And I think what people might think of when they think of uh and it continues to go on we've did some other stuff with michael butanil and dodine they don't have any of the mutations for for these things but these managed isolates that we pulled out there's just sort of generally resistance to them all and i think what people might think uh, is that um um populations that remain blasted with fungicides there are these multi-drug efflux pumps and it could be that you've created a uh um a multi-drug population in there and if you feel like your cap tan and your mancozib isn't working that well there might be a little bit of that going on but for the most part the cap tan and mancozib shouldn't have resistance development they're just hitting so many different mechanisms that it would need to be like this drug tossing uh isolate that needs to that would be really punching around in there and uh for the most part it's hard to test cap tan in vitro because the, the the fungicide works in a very different way you'll see lots of people trying it but for the most part, amongst the fungicide resistance community, it's generally considered a uh, it's mild no-no to test a lot of uh, multi-sites in vitro because of the way the system works. It behaves rather strangely, and it doesn't necessarily go after the mechanism of how they go. Um, I don't think you'll will run into Mancozeb and Captan resistance. I think in that case, it'll just be a poorly calibrated sprayer or a big glob of it sitting in the bottom of the tank. And, you know, there may be some really grumpy isolates, but for the most part, 
if we test this in the field, they still manage very well, even though we can kind of see this sort of, wow, at this level, they're a little more uh, generally um, recalcitrant to materials. And so um, we've done some genomics in that area and some other really crazy things happen as well. But very briefly, what ends up happening is the these super isolates, we'll call them, um, their genomes just get big. They're bigger than the standard baseline genome, which is like 40 megabases. It might be 61. They got all these crazy transposable elements floating around in them. And our guess is that they cause them to um, just chuck drugs left and right, <laughs> so to speak. So we didn't really talk about that today, but um, I, I don't think you'll see resistance per se, but you might find something that's really a, called a drug tosser. Yeah. So, Carrick, a few more. Uh, you mm -hmm. have suggested two and a half tons per acre of dolomitic lime as a substitute yep. for urea in late dormant. How does this yep. lime work on scab? Um, and then some practical questions. Do you spread it under the trees or across the whole orchard floor? And do you use ground lime? Um, well, what you want it, uh, you, with, with, the, with the lime or even the urea, um, you, you, you can put it on the tree. It won't, as uh, Lai Lang Chang tells me in um, Ithaca, that it's not going to appreciably cause your tree to keep growing crazy into the fall and cause trouble over wintering. Um, there was a, a nice series of talks that, um, from Bill McCarty that came back that showed do it in spring, do it in the fall. And, you know, it can basically, the urea and other things can sort of smother the overwintering apple scab structures and just sort of reduce the inoculum. It can and also in, enhance natural microbial decay. You want it on the leaves where the apple scab is surviving over the winter. And um, it actually doesn't matter so much um, whether you do it in the spring, spring and the winter, you want to do it whenever you can get into the orchard. So if your orchard is too soggy and sloppy in the spring, do it in the fall. Um, you want at time for microbial degradation. If you ever get the urea on you, at the, as it's also at a different rate, like 40 pounds to the acre, you'll feel it burning your skin. You're like, yeah, okay, that's doing that to those uh, pseudothesia. We're really taking them. And not to mention microbes and stuff can use these things and help degrade. You can also just sweep it and flail mow these things. Sometimes if the leaf flips upside down and the spores are gonna shoot into the dirt, um, hot dog. Um, that's what you want anyway. And what I've, I used to do some studies on the mummy berry pathogen that has a very similar life cycle in one sense. And anytime you disturb a mummy, its structure that shoots the ascospores is just ruined and it just gives up and pfft, dies. So you could even probably, uh, I mean, you can break them, blow them, and any one of those degradation things um, will help degrade as well as disorient or bust them. The only problem if you do it with your air blast sprayer, you could corrode your pump with the urea and if any of the other things are very acidic. So a uh, herbicide sprayer is not a bad way. Okay, great, thanks, Kirk. And does that include uh, just the timing for the lime? Would that also be that late fall timing? Or yeah, for early spring, as soon as okay. the snow melts. Um, what you don't wanna do is go in, like after the ascospore maturity model says, it's like ramped up and going. You want some time for to get that on there. So you, it might be easier that in the late fall, um, yeah, as soon as you can get it on the trees and it's really not going or on the ground and it's not really going to enhance growth or anything. You want to give it a lot of time to sort of degrade stuff um, at the end or the beginning. Your choice. Yeah. OK, great. Thanks, Kirk. That's all the questions I have in the chat box. Oh, there is something else coming in from from Dave. Dave Rosenberg. Nope, he probably has more advice on this topic. This is his this is his bag. Yeah. So I'll just I can just go ahead and read it so that we have it on the recording. Uh, concerning the options for controlling scab with sulfur, the literature has several excellent reports that show continued use of sulfur and liquid lime sulfur will, over the course of three to five years, reduce productivity by about 33% compared to trees receiving other fungicides. The only biological that seems to work without negative side effects are bicarbonates, but timing of these sprays is extremely critical after spore germination, but before the fungus invades the leaves. Most growers cannot time their sprays to get them applied within a six to eight hour window of effectiveness, day or night, seven days a week, over a two to three month period. Any other thoughts on that, Carrick? I mean, that's pretty much the, the spot on bicarbonate. It's really good. It's also good for powdery mildew too. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really when you start going for those biologicals, if something is effective, you really need to be um, very on top of it. It's almost like you need one of those in solid state sprayer systems to turn it on. And then you got to hope that whatever weather data that's feeding into your probably a fancier model that talks about spore germination like RIMPRO 
uh, you better hope that's as accurate as it can get. Yeah, it's just, I think it just requires too much agility to do it. I mean, if you're like a person with like 100 trees, you can pick all the scab leaves and fruit off. Um, but, you know, most people aren't rolling with that. And I think that's where it gets really challenging. Yeah, pretty much. And um, I've seen the, the lime sulfur trees. They, they look can, can look kind of sad. And apples can be very small, um, particularly if you combine it with the organic production paradigm. I mean, you can still do it, but you do seem to really, the trees do seem to not like getting the lime sulfur on it. I mean, if you've ever smelled or sprayed liquid lime sulfur, yeah, it's, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard material. It's, yeah. At this point, if we don't have additional questions, Carrick, do you have any sort of wrap up thoughts that you'd like to share with folks? Uh, or uh... Let's see, what do we do? Yeah, I there's a couple other things to watch out for. Um, uh, and just as in the medical medical um, thing, using the higher rate is generally advised. And um, you can, you know, to try to avoid mixture, I mean, sort of to avoid the selection for resistance. I, right now, there's a lot of work in modeling and wheat systems that I use the low rate and allows things to escape. Um, but in the tree fruit world, um, when things escape, you lose your crop. Also, when um, things you escape, there's more members of that population to become selected for. So uh, as so more like vet medicine, um, if you can use the high, use the full rate, just like when you go to the doctor to take your Z pack, take all of it doesn't mean bite the pill in half and swallow half and hope for the best. Um, um, use the full rates, use the higher rates, and um, including a, an additional mix partner doesn't matter in terms of resistance selection, whether or not it's another single site material like praclostrobin and fluxoperoxide, for example, or cat or mancozeb and fluxoperoxide or mancozeb and circadis. You know, those types of things will really slow stuff down. And I think we haven't seen um, a lot of um, trouble with the stuff is that we are still including a lot of the different materials, even if resistance has come through because DMI still work well against rust. Let's put one of those in there. And I think we haven't lost group sevens mainly because we're still rotating and everything. Oh, I can use doting again twice. I'll put that in there. Uh, I'll use an AP once or twice. And I'm still gonna rely a little bit on the multi-sites. Um, the one thing that we have that can be kind of disturbing if there is multiple fungicide resistance is that if you're using, if you have a known population that's got resistance to one material and it's something really hard like a QOI or benzimidazole, uh, there's a strong chance that those things are so prevalent that they're always associated with resistance to another fungicide if it were to occur because they're so prevalent. And if you go back and you use a group 11, it might end up dragging resistance to another one on so that you have uh, a super thing. But that happens mostly in strawberries. We haven't seen that so much in the, in the apple world. So we'll say with that. And you do get a little pull regardless with each exposure, regardless of the class. That's one thing that we learned, but not with the Captain and the Mancozebs. So we'll sort of leave it at that for now. Karen, we do have one last question before we head okay. out. Um, have you looked at Howler? Howler, that's a material for fire blight. Uh, at least I've looked at it for fire blight. Seems to control fire blight as in 2021 just fine. We had a cold bloom. I mean, I'd like to look at Howler again. Uh, I have not tried it for apple scab. All right, thanks, Kirk. If no more questions, let's uh, thank our speaker uh, one more time for his excellent uh, presentation. I definitely learned a lot from uh, from that. And um, thank you, Dr. Cox, uh, for for coming and. Um, Hope to see you again soon. Um, and that concludes our today's presentation. If, uh...